So here's the question. What's the difference between a superconductor and a really, really good conductor? Let's say the perfect metal. Some of you might already know the answer, and some of you don't, that's fine. But I bet a lot of you think you know the answer, but you don't really. In which case, you're in for a treat. Now the simple mainstream answer to that question is that a superconductor has zero resistance, but a normal metal, no matter how perfect, still has some finite resistance. Now that's not incorrect, but from the fundamental physics point of view, it's kind of like saying that the difference between a car and a pigeon is that a pigeon doesn't require regular oil change. It's not incorrect, but kind of missing the point. To show you the problem more clearly, here I've drawn resistance as a function of temperature for a superconductor and a normal metal. And as you can see, when we cool down, there is a certain transition temperature, or Tc, below which the resistivity of the superconductor goes to zero, while the normal metal still maintains a finite resistance. But suppose we stop the cooling halfway through the transition, while the superconductor still has some resistance. Now at this point, you might be tempted to think that there's not much difference between the, these two systems, or at least they should be somewhat similar. That is absolutely not the case. You see, even in this state, the superconductor and the normal metal couldn't be more different. And the reason for that is that the distinction between these two systems is the distinction between fermions and bosons. In a normal metal, charge transport is carried out by electrons, which are spin half particles and therefore fermions. Now, here's the thing about fermions. They can't share the same quantum state. That is to say that if you have a system of fermions, each particle needs to have its unique set of uh, quantum numbers. Let's say it has to have a unique quantum ID and requires to have its own state by which you can distinguish it from the other particles. So they are individual particles. Now, if you have a system with only uh, one electron, you could write the wave function for that and life is easy. But now if you add another electron to this system, you need to also introduce a new state and that completely changes your wave function. And this continues with every time you add an electron. And as a result, very quickly, your wave function gets so complicated that you can't define it anymore. And on top of that, all these individual quantized states are now blurred into each other and your system kind of loses all these interesting quantum characteristics. Superconductors, however, are the complete exception to this. It doesn't matter if your superconductor is only a few nanometers or as big as this blackboard, you can still define its wave function and it still preserves all its quantum characteristics. How? You see, at the transition temperature, the conduction electrons of a superconductor pair up with each other and form what is known as Cooper pairs. Now you have two half integer spin particles that have become a pair that have paired up and formed an integer spin particle, which makes it a boson. And here's the thing about bosons. They can all share a single macroscopic quantum state regardless of their numbers. So whether you have uh, one Cooper pair, one pair of electrons, or billions and billions and billions of them, it doesn't matter. They can still reside in a single quantum state which you can describe very elegantly by a single wave function. And that is the wave function of any pair of electrons in your system, the wave function of the Cooper pair. Now here I need to emphasize something. 
You see, you can't look at a superconductor and point to individual Cooper pairs. You can't say, well, here, these Cooper pairs are doing that, those Cooper pairs are doing this. No. You see, the moment you formed Cooper pairs, all the electron pairs have become indistinguishable. What does that mean? Well, maybe this analogy would help. You see, fermions or individual electrons are pretty much, you can think of them as rain droplets. You see, when it's raining, you could take a snapshot and, or freeze time, and you can point to individual droplets and identify them as individual entities, distinguishable from one another. But once you let these rain droplets fall into ground and form puddles, they stop being individuals. You see, you can't look at an ocean and say, well, this droplet in the ocean is doing that and that droplet is doing this. No, an ocean is one entity. And a similar thing happens with superconductors. You start off with individual fermions, distinguishable particles, which pair up and become a part of a single macroscopic condensate. And because of that, regardless of their size, they can preserve all their exotic, their interesting quantum characteristics, which makes them really an indispensable ingredient in all the emerging quantum technologies, such as quantum computers. So hopefully next time you hear about superconductors or think about them, you'll see them more than just very efficient, futuristic power transmission lines, and you'll see them for what they really are, which are macroscopic quantum systems. So to recap, in normal materials, the physical characteristics are dominated by fermions, whereas in a superconductor, we're dealing with a bosonic condensate. And fermions and bosons play by a very different set of rules. In the next episode, I'll be telling you about some of the consequences this has when we look at a superconducting ring near the transition temperature while it still has some resistance. This is the famous Little Prox experiment. Finally, a quick note. Since this is my first video, I think I should provide some context. Uh, this series is based on the casual one-to-one -one conversations I usually have with my students when they start a project. It's meant to bring out the key aspects of our research to speed up their progress. But this also means that I often have to leave out some details. For instance, just now, in this video, I conveniently ignored the Meissner effect, but I will cover that in a later video. However, my point is that uh, you shouldn't think of this as a substitute for a rigorous undergraduate or graduate course on condensed matter or superconductivity. Instead, think of it more as a supplementary material to provide you with some intuitive understanding of the underlying physics. And I hope you'll enjoy the show.